Hello and welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you are thriving, when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindfulness Mama Mentor. I coach overstressed moms on how to cultivate self-awareness in their daily lives and to help take family and life to a new level of awakening. I've been practicing yoga and mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting Course. And I'm the mom of two girls, ages seven and 10. Oh my gosh, they're getting so old. Thank you so much for being here, dear listener. I'm so grateful that you're here and that we have this time to connect together. Today is an interview podcast. I'm excited to uh, share with you it's actually my second interview with Brian Leaf. He's hilarious. He cracks me up and he has a new book all about taking your lo- yoga to um, a new level. And it's um, it's a funny, ridiculous book, kind of just like Brian. It's pretty great. So I think you'll like that. And uh, we mix it up here in Mindful Mama and we'll have interviews and episodes with just me and you. And once a month, I have my friend Carla Nomberg on to discuss mindful parenting. So I would also like to do some Q&A episodes. So if you have a Q that I can A, send your questions to hunter at hunteryoga.com. Um, before we dive into this episode, uh, if you are listening in real time, which means in March 2017, I think we are maybe releasing this right on the Ides of March, people. So um, if you're listening to it now, then I encourage you to check out the events page, hunteryoga.com slash events. And um, coming up the end of this month, Carla Nomberg and I are holding a weekend-long retreat at the wonderful Copper Beach Retreat Center. It's a really lovely, down-to-earth place with a great director. It's held in a, a, a you know, it shares the space with a, a Catholic retreat center and it has this beautiful labyrinth in the back and it's this beautiful place in Hartford, Connecticut. And you get to hang out with us for the whole weekend and we'll do some yoga and mindfulness and we'll have fun and be down to earth. And we'll go deeper so that you can really return to your family really refreshed and renewed and revived. And then I have another live in-person event that I want to share with you that is coming up, which is in May, uh, we've just started sign up. So there's limited space available for the Mindful Mother's Day retreat. And that's here in my hometown of Wilmington, Delaware. I mean, I live here now, but I did grow up in Rhode Island. Anyway, <laughs> it's at the uh, the Mindful Mother's Day retreat. It's going to be a day-long retreat that is going to be wonderful on May 13th. And we're actually going to be retreating to the beautiful, elegant Winterthur Museum um, in Delaware, Museum Country Estate and Gardens. And we will be having the retreat in the um, the period rooms in the Winter Term Museum and breaking for lunch at their beautiful cafe and hopefully having a beautiful nice day where we have walking meditation through their incredible flowering gardens. So there's limited space for both Copper Beach and the Mindful Mother's Day retreat. So I encourage you to go over to the hunteryoga.com slash events and check them out. Actually, the Mother's Day retreat you can find it at hunteryoga.com slash Mother's Day. So um, no apostrophe. <laughs> but that's it. I en- hope you enjoy this episode. Like I said, Brian cracks me up. I think you'll have a lot of fun. And on to the episode. Hi, Hunter here, and welcome to Yoga Stories Project. I'm happy to have on again Brian Leaf, who's an author and a yogi, and he was on the podcast, (laughs) yes, literally again, because we just thought we were recording this interview and then weren't. So anyway, here we go to take take it again. But Brian's uh, the author of The Adventures of a Garden State Yogi, Adventures of a Parenting Yogi, which are really great books I totally recommend you read. They're hilarious. They will make you laugh and love yoga. And he's come out with a new book, which is The Teacher Appears. And 
Brian, you were telling me about this book and about this idea of being in alignment, but I want you, I want you to tell everyone what we just talked about and we didn't record, but which is that you were, when you were doing this work that was out of alignment, which I think is kind of hilarious work for you to have been doing. And so tell us, tell us what that work was. I'm not going to say it again. Oh, come on. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so what we were talking about was um, Hunter asked, you know, how I came upon this book. And so uh, years ago, I was writing, before I wrote the yoga books, I was writing test prep books. Uh, I think I'm the only, you know, best-selling yoga and test prep author <laughs> out there, probably. Uh, Rodney Yee, I think, used to be in test prep before <laughs> yoga. Oh, he did <laughs> He wasn't? That's not right? I don't know. No, I thought you were joking. That's so great. That's not true. true. (laughs) Sean Korn was. She was with the Princeton Review. No, it's not true either. But anyway, so before I wrote the yoga books, I was writing test prep books. And this one book that I was working on, actually it was a series of four, there was, uh, I wrote these vocabulary workbooks based on Stephanie Meyer's best-selling Twilight books. And whenever I tell that to anybody, such as you five minutes ago, we aren't recording. <laughs> everybody always says, that's amazing. What a great idea. And it was, and it's a great idea and there's nothing wrong with it, but it wasn't right for me. I wasn't in alignment. I was out of alignment. I, I, I feel like, and this is probably true for everybody. I feel like if I have to fake it, it's draining. And so in the, if I wasn't faking it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's great assignment, great books, could make a lot of money, help people. It's all good. But for me, it wasn't right. I was faking it. My guidance, my intuition, you know, told me it wasn't right for me, but I did it anyway because it seemed like it was going to make money, which is not, nothing wrong with making money, but being out of alignment, I think, is not sustainable. It's not healthy. And I think that's true for everybody, probably. The vampires were not calling to you. They were not. So I, <laughs> I would literally have to go on, you know, I was just saying, I would literally have to go on the Twilight websites and essentially kind of have to pretend, I mean, that I was a big Twilight fan, that I was really into Edward Cullen and swooning for you know, Robert Pattinson and, and the movies and the books. And I, and like, for example, I remember one day I, re, I didn't want to meet my editor even because I just thought to myself, if I show up to meet this guy, who am I going to be? You know, like there's no me really. Uh, and so that is, is a huge lesson. So for me, I, and ultimately when I do that, when I'm out of alignment in that way, it ends in depression. And so I was very depressed. And so one day I was meditating and I just was so depressed and I, it occurred to me, that I needed to reach deep inside and write about what I cared about most, who I really was, who I could be authentic about, you know, 24 seven all the time. And that's where Garden State Yogi came from. Uh, I mentioned I had this big uh, New York agent for those other books, you know, Twilight was so huge. And so one day I said to him, you know, he said, oh, next book could be about, you know, whatever, the West Wing or something. I said, no, next book is going to be a yoga memoir. <laughs> and uh, he fired me. He, that, was, <laughs> that was the end of it. But uh, I did save my soul, I think. So I wrote Misadventure of Garden State Yogi. It was great. When I was writing, I just felt like so alive, like I was bursting with energy, just, you know, rainbows coming out of my ears. <laughs> and then I liked it so much, I kept going. I wrote Misadventures of a Parenting Yogi. And after that, um, I started working on another book. And this time I caught it early. I could tell I was out of alignment. So I gave that book up and then I meditated. I tried to look inside and I said, what's coming out of me next? You know, what's the next project? Where, where's my energy going? And that's where the teacher appears came from. It, it just sort of birthed out of me. And then I would, I would go to, you know, I'd meditate and then go to my computer and write and all this stuff would just come out. And it was just such a good experience. And that's the best kind of, I think, creative project. Cause you know, in that moment, I didn't even care if the book did well or not. It was really just such a delight to write. And that's, that's good. That's so cool. I love, I love that you have fun, you know, while you're writing, it can be really challenging to write, you know, it's, it can be hard to kind of get those thoughts out. And, um, and I love that it it's, it's fun for you. And, but th- it's interesting because this book has, um, you know, it has like pictures to color and has all these different things to do. And it has all these sort of guest contributors. So I'm wondering, like, did you, did you consult with, you know, uh, Krishna Das and Sean Korn and Sharon Gannon and Shiva Ray to, to, to be part of this book or did Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yeah. No, 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 of course. Yeah. Yeah. They all contributed those, awesome. those, uh, those prompts into the book. Yeah. I just reached out, uh, to, you know, to them. I would just, 
um, I just reached out to all the different yogis that I could think of and asked them if they wanted to participate. And uh, people were really, really giving. They were really into it, actually. Everybody was really thrilled to do it. And they wrote some great stuff. It was really fun. And it was fun, too. You know, here are these people who are kind of my mentors, and I look up to them. And it was fun to facilitate them, you know, because some of them aren't writers, and they'd say, oh, I don't know what to write. And I would get to facilitate them in that process, because I would just say to them, essentially, you know, don't think about what you want to write. Just think about, you know, the thing that you need to say is so close to you. It's so obvious that you don't even know it. You know, it's like, what do you say during class? What are you known for? What characterizes you? What do your students think of when they think of you? Uh, Or even just pretend we're in a class and you've got the mic on and you're walking around the room. Just give me your spiel. And, you know, that's a perfect prompt for them. Mm. Uh, So it was fun. It was fun doing that. And it was really enjoyable. I mean, you know, it was kind kind of a high. I'm sitting there, you know, at lunch with a friend. My, you know, iPhone is out on the table like everybody's. I feel like the iPhone is, is like the cowboy belt of like 150 years ago. <laughs> you know, like you sit down at a restaurant, you take out your iPhone, put it on the table or, you know, like people used to take off their gun belt. So anyway, so, you know, I'm sitting at uh, lunch at a restaurant, my phone's on the table and sure enough, you know, in the middle of lunch, I'm getting an email from, I don't know, Sean Korn or uh, Krishna Das giving me their prompt. It was, it was sweet. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. I love that. So, I mean, you have some interesting questions in here, you know, and I was thinking about talking to you for the podcast. And I was like, wow, you know, I, I just have this book of all these questions that I can just ask, turn around and ask you, which I think is so interesting, you know, oh, like, you, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> that's what you get for writing this book. Right. But, but I like this one, like, are you the same person in yoga class and at work? How would you answer that? I mean, that's an interesting one you chose because Mm -hmm. that's exactly what I was saying before. That's my whole mission. You know, that's, that's sort of one of my guiding like principles really, or my intentions, I would say in life. Um, and, uh, so I, you know, I noticed that actually many, many years ago, uh, I talk about this in garden state yogi. I noticed one day, uh, there's a story in misadventure of garden state yogi where I had graduated from teacher training in 1995. And uh, it was maybe around 1996 or 1997. I was teaching yoga in New Jersey. And um, I, I was really thirsty. I was on the way to class. And I think I was hungry or thirsty. And so I stopped. The only place I could find to stop was a subway. And I got a, a, you know, like a sub and I got some water. And the water they gave me was in a Coca-Cola cup. And uh, I was driving to class and I, I pulled into the parking lot and I parked. And all of a sudden I realized I'm holding this like giant like virtually like a big gulp of a you know, Coca-Cola <laughs> cup. And I was really embarrassed. Uh, I didn't want anybody to see me holding it. So I stashed it on the seat. And that was when I realized there was a problem. You know, there's, oh, there's nothing wrong with drinking Coke and I wasn't actually even. And I don't know, I just didn't want to have to feel like I was faking it. You know, I wanted to just be real. So that is actually one of my huge intentions. And I would say, I would say hopefully uh, I am, I, I have, achieve that. You know, that's the point of these books, I guess. That's the point Mm -hmm. of not writing the Twilight books for me. And again, nothing wrong with Coke, nothing wrong with Twilight books. Maybe. I don't know. But uh, (laughs) maybe, maybe. But for me, not the right thing. So I would say hopefully I'm the same at work and in yoga class. Well, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, because that's kind of like the whole point of yoga in some way is to see who we are, see who we are kind of from those gross outer levels to, to kind of look at this outer body and then go inward and go inward and kind of see our thoughts and see our heart and, um, you know, get to this level of accepting and embracing who we are. I think that's kind of the, the whole point of everything, I guess, in, in yoga, you know, if you think big picture. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. I agree. You know, on a related note, uh, there was a great prompt in there from Mayim Bialik. Mm. Um, who, you know, not a big yoga teacher in the country, but somebody I connected with for the parenting yoga book. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, she, she likes yoga and she's super smart and really interesting. So I asked her to write a prompt and she was really gracious. She did. My Bialik is, uh, you know, she was, um, Blossom. She was Blossom when we were kids. And then now of course, Big Bang Theory and she's great. So she wrote a prompt about, um, is it, how is it different for you? How do you experience it differently when you do yoga at home by yourself, if you do? Uh, versus in class with other people. And I thought that was really it's a similar kind of, you know, feel, but a little different. I thought that was a great one. Because again, that too, for me, you know, I don't know, maybe not everybody struggles with this. But for me, that was huge. Like, in fact, mostly the only times I ever hurt myself 
been doing yoga 25 years or I don't know more. The only times I ever hurt myself, honestly, was when I was showing off in class. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, one time I was showing off for a teacher who I wanted to, I wanted him to choose me as a sort of student disciple type thing, hurt myself. One time I was showing off for this woman uh, and uh, hurt myself. <laughs> so, so, you know, that was a big thing for me and in a lot of ways, class versus, you know, practicing at home, um, which reminds me, there's another prompt in there I really like, which says, um, I'll know that I have made it or, you know, that I've achieved something when in yoga class I can, and then there's a blank. Mm. And at the bottom of the page, it says, if you wrote handstand, cross out and redo. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, because I feel like to me, I'll know that I've achieved something real when I can practice in a class with a group in the same kind of inward, mindful, non-self-conscious way that I might at home by myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's so challenging because, you know, as soon as you open your eyes, your mirror neurons have turned on, you know, it's like, it's just part of the way we are built as far as animals built to survive is that we have these comparison neurons, we have these mirror neurons, and they're turned on. And so to, it's interesting, because I think that a lot of the practice that we do in in yoga to, to let go of it, it seems to like a lot of our practice is to sort of let go of our fight flight or freeze response let go of some of these responses that keep us on guard and 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 things like that that are these survival instincts and it's this sort of wanting to transcend these survival instincts to a more peaceful and accepting place yet you know we are animals and we have all these things so it's it's really challenging to do Absolutely. That's a, That's interesting. I, I hadn't really thought about it in that way that those fitting in um, or comparing ourselves to others instincts, you know, are, are serve a purpose. That's interesting. I guess in a way it's like the stress response itself. It serves a purpose. I remember I went to this workshop many years ago and the teacher said, um, you know, the stress response served us well when we were, you know, I don't know, cave people running from a tiger or whatever. But now when you're sitting there doing your bills, and you're so stressed you break your pencil in half by accident, that stress <laughs> response is not serving us. It doesn't, it doesn't give us anything. It doesn't make us pay the bills faster or have more money to do it with, whereas it did help us. The stress response did help us run faster from the predator. You know, or, or like you know, um, when we, uh, in stress, somebody might hold their breath. And I mm-hmm. guess you know, if you're hiding in a bush from a predator or from a, an attacker of some kind, holding the breath and being silent actually serves a purpose. But holding the breath all day because we're stressed about a writing deadline, definitely not, does not, does not help. So, uh, so yeah, that's interesting. But I never thought about the comparison as part of our evolutionary, you know, thing that's, that would might have served us in some way, but then, you know, doesn't when we show off for a teacher and then hurt my back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, when um, there's a particular posture, like a seated forward fold, I feel like everybody's always like looking at each other. <laughs> how, <laughs> how far can you fold forward? And I'm like, please, please close your eyes, please. <laughs> Just <laughs> turn off those comparison neurons. That's um, a hard one to be a guy. That I, <laughs> men are built a little different, and yeah. that's a hard one, you know, because uh, we we just can't go as far. Like if I'm being honest with my forward bend. It's it's not pretty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it, like there's only so you know your bones are shaped a certain way. There's only so much you know opening that can happen there. It's not like an an achievement to to really round forward in, in your forward bend. Um, but and yeah, of course we all know that ultimately it doesn't matter, right? Mm-hmm. We all you know we all know that. Yeah, I always love telling my yoga students that everybody's feeling the same stretch. It doesn't matter how deep you are in it. The whole goal is you go to your edge and you feel the posture, you feel your muscles, you feel the awareness of the stretch. So it doesn't matter how deep you are in it. So that's why it's nice to be honest with the stretch. So what does your yoga practice look like now? So you've been practicing for 25 years. You know, you practiced, uh, you know, as a parent with young kids and you practiced on your own and you've done all these different things. What does your practice look like these days? Like any good yogi of 25 years of experience, I no longer do yoga. No, that's, <laughs> not that's not true. Actually, I remember my yoga teacher, my favorite yoga teacher ever, uh, uh, who was in Hoboken, Yolantha Smith. She was wonderful, a good friend as well. I remember she, uh, I was like 22 and she was 50. And I remember I was just aghast because she didn't really do yoga anymore, at least the postures. So that does happen sometimes with, with mm. people. Um, but 
so right now, first of all, my yoga practice, I would say at this point, is primarily focused around my meditation. Um, but I still do postures. For a while, I didn't actually. I was writing so much and parenting and little kids and so busy. It actually, the postures, because they weren't my, my focus anymore, they did actually slip away for a while. And uh, I actually started getting really stiff. And, uh, you know, I was get, uh, ironically, I was getting older and I was getting, and I was stressed and I was sitting all day writing. This is when I was writing the narrative books. And um, I remember one day I was on the floor playing with my kids and I had to push myself up and I was super stiff and I had to stay still for like a minute after I got up. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this isn't, this isn't going to do. And I didn't know if maybe I was just older and it was permanent. You know, that's the way it was going to be. But then I realized that my postures had really slipped away. I was still meditating every day. So I got back into it. I started doing it again. And I'm happy to say that yoga works, it turns out. <laughs> um, you know, even on a physical level, it works in a lot of different ways. But on the physical level, I, now I'm, you know, I can hop up and down off the ground like a, like a young man of 45, no problem. <laughs> so, so my posture is now, my practice now is um, I do uh, probably like 20 minutes of postures, 15, 10 to 20 minutes of postures every day. Uh, I do a nice long relaxation at the end. I really believe in that. Um, and then I, I try to sit once or twice a day. I don't always achieve that. but um, And, you know, I would say my yoga practice now um, is really mostly the practice of trying to trying to surrender to to guidance, to to God, to to the oneness, you know. And the postures and the meditation are really tools for that. Hmm. Tell me more about that, like surrender to oneness. And so the, how, how are the, how do the postures help you do that? Okay. That's a good question. Um, well, first of all, let me explain what surrender to the oneness means. Cause what the heck is that? <laughs> um, there's a prompt in the book I really like that says, um, faith is an act of great will practice constantly. And I would say that in a nutshell really is my practice. Faith is an act of great will practice constantly. I really do believe that, that, you know, I think we're probably a unique time and place in history and culture where that's sort of a weird thing to say. You know, faith really was the cornerstone at most times. Ritual, faith, um, divination, the stars, numerology, astrology, you know, all that stuff now is like wonky. And, you know, like a politician gets scared if they believe in any of that. But this is literally, I mean, it's, it's interesting to really step back and think about this. This is probably the only time in history where a politician can't say they follow that. Any other time in history, and even many other places right now, a politician would be skewered if they didn't follow the old ways, if they didn't respect faith and you know, divination and, and, and that kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. I think in India now, it's, it's regularly practiced. A buddy of mine goes to India regularly, and he says that when he comes home, it's a, sort of a shock to his system that in India – there's so much um, kind of bhakti yoga. There's so much devotion and so much um, kind of love for God and feeling loved by God that it's a shock to come here. It's sort of a cold, lonely shock when he first gets back. So it's like uh, faith versus modern skepticism, uh, so sort of a, a healthy like questioning and, and looking at things. Is that what you're talking about? It's a good question. Um, uh, I mean, questioning is always good. Well, let's see. I guess, you know, I, I think that all of us, when we meditate or do yoga and drop in, there's sort of like a trust or a faith um, in something. You know, mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like how, why are so many yogis environmentalists, right? I think it's because when we do our yoga, when we, um, when we meditate, we just become a little bit more attuned and sensitive. And this sort of awareness pretty universally comes through people where suddenly they start to care for certain things and, and become more environmentalist, really. And that, I would say, is kind of what I'm talking about. There's like to drop in, there comes this knowing, this sort of faith, a felt sense, you know, and uh, without having to even use the word God, which does turn a lot of people off because it's got a lot of luggage behind it now. Um, that's sort of what I'm talking about is that, that felt sense of what's right to even go back to the beginning of our conversation, knowing that when I was writing the twilight books, 
nothing good or bad or right or wrong about that project, but it wasn't right for me. Mm-hmm. That felt sense as faith to me. Yeah, yeah. I think I, hmm, I think it's interesting. I'm kind of as I'm listening, hearing you say this because you know, for me, I, I'm personally. Um, I guess you would call me an atheist because I'm, I personally don't believe in, um, a single all powerful deity. And, um, and that, um, that, which is a little controversial as my first reveal in the podcast. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, but, um, Actually, it's very hip right now to be an atheist. <laughs> so nobody's going to blame me for that. <laughs> okay, cool. but it's interesting because when, as I start to sort of think about these things in my own mind, um, about the idea, of what you say is a surrender to oneness. Like if you put in the word oneness to me, like then it all kind of makes more sense because, like, you know, I see us as, you know, I am a. You know, the the metaphor I like to think of myself as is like I am I am like a, a whirlpool in the ocean or in a river, right? And I am a whirlpool in that in that there's this you could point at it and say, there it is. Um, but the, it, all the cells of the ocean are constantly flowing it through it. And it's also just part, it's just the ocean as well. You know, and so when you think about the us in that sense, like myself as this whirlpool, but then I am also the ocean. So that is everything around me. That is the earth. That is our universe that I am not, I don't feel like I am separate from that. And I think maybe that's what you're pointing to this idea of that yoga points us to this, uh, lack of, of separation between ourselves and the rest of the earth, the rest of the environment, the people and, and everything that is, um, wow. Who knew we'd get so deep, Brian? Oh my gosh. But is that what you're talking about? Oh, what else is there? (laughs) You know, you could have gone a different direction. You could have like chosen the prompt in the book that challenges the reader. (laughs) To fart loudly during <laughs> class at least one time. I, I saw that one. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that you know you could have gone that route instead, but this is the route we went. So here we are. No, but I I really think that I mean the Yoga Sutras, right? The the first few lines of the Yoga Sutras say that the aim of yoga is to seat one is to seat the the yogi in his or her true self, in their heart, in their deepest self, rather than uh, the you know, the flowings of the, of the mind stuff, rather than incorrectly uh, associating with those emotions or thoughts that go through. And that's really what yoga and meditation do for, for me, and I think for, for many of us, right, is that, you know, it's like, it can feel like all I am is the fear or the anger or whatever. And then, you know, you meditate or you get a little perspective and you go, oh, okay, that's an experience. And then, and I'm having that experience, but it's not me. Um, anyway, I, I guess that doesn't really relate to the oneness, but it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> So, so I, I think our culture gets really tripped up uh, around God. You know, I threw the God word in there a little early. <laughs> Should have waited a little bit. But our culture gets really tripped up around it. And, you know, without using the word, I think the easiest thing I could say really is that, you know, I think we've all had this experience. It's, it's got to be partly why we all do yoga. This experience that happens after a class where Like I say, we just sort of drop in, drop down. Like I remember early on in my yoga practice, I always felt like hugging somebody after class, you know, uh, as opposed to before class, I was just sort of a normal heady kind of academic-y kid, you know, walking around, not feeling super connected and close and in my heart. And after class, I would just feel in my heart in a different way, more connected, more peaceful. To me, that space is the oneness, you know, is, is approaching the oneness. Mm, You're just letting go of all the like extra layers around it. And so you kind of, that's the surrender and yeah, absolutely. That's the the surrender into, you know, just, yeah. I mean, seeing the intensity of it all, like, holy shit, I've got these like arms that I've got these legs and blood pulsing through and you've got this vibrational energy and you're right there too. I mean, in some ways it's, that's for me, that's kind of the experience is like, wow, holy moly, look at this. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because earlier when you asked the question, you said faith versus a healthy questioning, mm. which, you know, it, it's, it's <laughs> I was leading you on. <laughs> It just kind of like shows, you know, a bit of a bias, but yeah. that's our culture. And I, you know, it's almost like we're like, 
we're like recovering and reeling from some sort of misuse of power, I guess, historically, you know, I guess things went in the faith-based systems that we had before this. And when I say faith-based, I don't mean, you know, the preacher on TV. I just mean culture in the past. Uh, you know, I guess there was some sort of abuse of power or abuse of that faith. And it's like our culture in the scientific method is kind of reeling against that. And, uh, you know, considers then like in the term healthy questioning, which I have no problem with, of course, but, but, uh, and, and, you know, I, I assume at some point we're going to just sort of rebalance where the two can exist hand in hand, where to be in a, to be in faith, um, to be in that yogic space, we don't have to give away our power and give away healthy questioning at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We could even make inquiry from that space, you know, like, mm -hmm. like for example, um, when I was writing the Twilight books, if I did that purely from a heady place, of course I should do the Twilight books. They're popular. They're going to make money. But from a felt sense, from a heart sense, the answer was clear no. And a lot of successful people really who don't even speak in God and yoga terms speak about that felt sense. You know, Steve Jobs was a big one and Bill Gates and um, yoga people too, obviously. But, but a lot of people talk about that, that felt sense and, and what kind of really following their guidance, following their hunches, their intuition, and what kind of success it brings. I love uh, the um, uh, Joseph Campbell stuff, you know, follow your bliss. Uh, he spoke about it in a really approachable way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the force, <laughs> Luke, uh, all I, that. <laughs> it's great. I did this great radio interview the other day. It was like an NPR style radio show. And uh, the, the DJ uh, or the interviewer after our interview, he clipped in all these little like movie clips. It was great. He had a lot of Yoda in there, a lot of force stuff. It was terrific. Of course, of course, you gotta have that. I get. Um, so, one of your one of your prompts is the book. In the book is no lies today. See how it feels. And I think this does kind of go back to what we were talking about in the beginning. But like, how do, have you done that? Like a, a day with completely without lies? Because I know you're a parent. <laughs> <laughs> so just curious have you have you tried that and, and that's awesome and by the way at the bottom of that page it says tear out this page and stick it into your pocket so you won't forget yeah yeah you're it's always this book is always telling you to tear out pages out of it <laughs> well, I, really, I really wanted the book to jump off the pages you know i wanted it to be like like cross the fourth wall sort of you know like in ferris bueller when he turns to the camera and talks right to you i wanted the book to be like that and and I also want it to be something that, that matters, that it's in paper, that, that kind of mattered to me too. Mm -hmm. But anyway, mm -hmm. have I done that? I'm stalling here. No, um, <laughs> I, I don't know that I have. That's a good question. Um, I, I definitely haven't torn the page out and folded in my pocket. I, I would say, you know what? It's a good challenge. I'm glad you pointed out. I mean, I certainly try not to lie very much. I try to practice almost, you know, radical honesty, really. But have I gone a day with no lie whatsoever? I gotta think about that. That's a really good question because, like you said, I have kids, <laughs> um, and I have a partner, and I have a business, and uh, so that's a good question. I, you know what? I'm gonna do it tomorrow. I'm gonna tear out a page from one of the many books sitting here in my <laughs> office, and uh, I'm gonna try that. that I, I don't know. I think I think I probably have done it but I did not do it intentionally with the page in my pocket. It, it, it's interesting because I, I was thinking about that um, recently because I thought, oh, you know, I thought to myself at some point, like, I don't lie. You know, I'm pretty truthful. Like, I'm, I'm an extremely straightforward person in a lot of ways. But then, um, but then I started sort of listening and paying attention to myself. And it's interesting, like, how... You know, uh, I, it's just like little stuff that it's like where it's like it's a, a question of kindness versus lying. That's where I, we I think get, where I get tripped up anyway. It's like, oh, is it is it kinder not to you know, or like, do I really say you know about the tooth fairy like? Um, <laughs> And it's interesting because of the lessons I've realized I've taught my children about this. Like, so we have um, on Halloween, we did this thing where we had, we totally made up the Halloween fairy and <laughs> the Halloween fairy came and would take most of your candy. You would take up like five pieces and the Halloween fairy, you would take most of your candy and leave you a little toy instead, which we thought was like this awesome way to just get rid of like the mounds of sugar in our house. 
And then this year, life happened, and my six-year-old, like, the Halloween fairy just didn't have her stuff together this year to (laughs) do that. (laughs) And my older daughter is nine, and she has figured this all out, so she knows what's going on. And my younger daughter is six, and so we're walking along on Halloween, and, and my younger daughter says something like, oh, you know, but what about the Halloween fairy? And she asked me, and my older daughter didn't skip a beat. She said... Oh, well, um, you know, the Halloween fairy's not coming. She's like, because you know what? Mommy and daddy buy the toy for the Halloween fairy. And they, mommy and daddy forgot to buy the toy for the Halloween fairy. And it was so like, <laughs> I was like, whoa, I've totally taught my daughter to lie. A was one thought, but like, oh my God, isn't that so kind too? You know, on the other hand. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I don't know. I get well, a little no, lost there. It's- What's that? I get a little tripped up there. No, of course. I think I think the teaching of truth in the you know in the sutras and the yamas and niyamas, it probably is not radical honesty like that book that was you know popular ten years ago. It probably is um, truth mixed with ahimsa, you know, mixed with nonviolence. So I think you're onto something there. Um, absolutely, there's no doubt. I think we have to mix truth with with um, nonviolence. Now that said, I yeah, I, I mean. Well, I, I don't think I lie too many times a day. Well, let me ask you this. We've been on the you know, podcast here for maybe 30 minutes. Any lies on your end so far? That's a great question. I don't really know. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm trying to think if I lied at all. Let's see. <laughs> um, gosh, I lied in the past 30 minutes. I don't think so. I, let's see. I, I did mention that my forward bend is difficult for me. I didn't say that, you know, it comes easily. It's, it's hard to say. We're, we're very subjective, I think. Yeah. No, but I think no lies in the last 30 minutes. I feel pretty good about that. Okay. The listeners can really trust <laughs> what we've said so far. I feel good about it. Uh, okay. Um, well, so you have some big questions along with the like fart loudly. You have some big questions too in the book, which is like, one I'd love to ask you is, you know, why do you do yoga? Yeah, that's that is that's a great question. That one's one of the first questions in the book. Mm-hmm. And again, at the bottom, there's a little asterisk which says there's no wrong answer. You know, mm-hmm. because I think a lot of times there's a pressure to feel like there's a certain right answer, and it's really it's important to give somebody freedom and and you know space to just say whatever it is, man. Don't don't judge it. Mm-hmm. You know, actually, it's like um, my kids go to a Waldorf school, and uh, sometimes we joke around that. You know, nowadays, most people basically work on a computer one way or another for a living, Mm -hmm. uh, or a lot of people do. But uh, at the school, at this Waldorf school, which is a very kind of, you know, progressive, kind of hippie-ish type type school, it's great. I love it. Great program. But all the parents feel really ashamed (laughs) if if you're not like a farmer or a, uh, or like basically a carpenter. If you're you're not working with wood or the land. Or knitting. (laughs) Or knitting. Sure. Absolutely. Then we all kind of feel ashamed. Oh my God! When my when Noah started, at, my older son started at the Waldorf school when he was really little. I was writing the Twilight books. Could you imagine? Like people say, "Oh, what do you do for a living?" And I say, "I write vocabulary books for the SAT test based on the Twilight books." So that's half the reason I started writing yoga books. So I had something you know to talk about at the parent meetings. No, not really. But um, but uh, so wait, what was your question? Oh, why do I do yoga? Why do I do yoga? So uh, it all started when I was 17, actually, 17 or 18. I went off to college, and I was very sick. I had uh, ulcerative colitis, um, which is a lot of what that first book, the Garden State Yogi book, is about. And uh, I went off to college, to Georgetown University in D.C., and uh, just on a lark, I signed up for a yoga class. I mean, I would definitely say it was fate and dharma and karma, but, but at the time, I, just, I was looking through the catalog, and it was something weird, and so I had no idea what to expect. I literally don't know what I expected. And I signed up for yoga class. And I show up the first day. It's 1989. And this dude with a huge beard and leather sandals and all white walks in. So this was, <laughs> he was like the real deal. And uh, actually, it was me at the, it was in the gym at Georgetown. It was me and like 30 women. And so I was, I was kind of intimidated. You think I, you know, you'd think I was like all psyched, but I was actually pretty scared. I just felt, I don't know, kind of, you know, intimidated. And then he shows up and I, I thought, well, what, what am I doing? And he comes up. I thought, well, this, this is yoga, I guess. So we started doing it. And right off the bat, day one, uh, you know, and again, I bet a lot of yogis have the same experience. It was like I came home. It just spoke to me. It was just clearly 
who I was. You know, it's like some people probably feel that way when they start shooting a basketball for the first time or go to Tai Chi or, you know, run or something. But it was like I was home. It was, it was, you know, I had been on another planet my whole life. And then all of a sudden I just found this place where I belonged and it just, I just lit up. I just turned on. Um, and so from then on, I was just super into it. And in college, I was kind of like the annoying guy who, you know, you know, when you first get into yoga and you have to like do it all the time and show everybody and talk about it incessantly. So, you know, we'd be like stopped at a stoplight or something, uh, walk into some bar or something and I would throw a posture out, um, <laughs> you know, uh, so, but I got really, really into it right away. And I just, it wasn't even a choice. It just was, it just is what I love. It's just who I am, what I do. So that's why I do it really is just because it's, you know, it's the same as breathing. But I would say if I had to get a little bit more thoughtful about why I do it, it's really what we've talked about the whole conversation, I guess. Yoga brings me into alignment. It brings me into my authentic self. And when I'm in my authentic self, I feel most comfortable. I feel happiest. And I have the most energy available to me. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why I do yoga. Mm, I think that I love the word you used, um, comfortable, because I think that's a really important word. You know, I think that a lot of us spend our days in some discomfort, right? Some mental discomfort, some physical discomfort ends up being the same thing, you know? And uh, I think that is, it's about getting comfortable in our own bodies and in our minds and hearts. Absolutely. I, I love that word, comfortable. Mm. Yeah. I think you're right. I mean, I think that if I had gone down the route of continuing to do the Twilight books or books like that, I think I would be very uncomfortable, you know, mm -hmm. and I would probably seek to numb the discomfort mm -hmm. in all kinds of ways, you know, drugs, alcohol, prescription, whatever, um, horror movies, very loud music, you know, not that those <laughs> things are bad, but those might be ways that I would have numbed out to feeling really uncomfortable. And so I'm really grateful, actually that I was able to see that yoga in part helped me see, but, but that I was able to see, I think another thing that's, that's another thing yoga does for us. Actually. In fact, one of my old teachers, Jeff Migdow at Kripalu, he has this great quote, something like, uh, if you do yoga, you have to be open to change because yoga will show you the truth. And it's hard to hold in inauthentic posture. It's hard to hold mm. being out of alignment mm -hmm. when yoga shows it to you so much. So I guess it was, you know, in a large part yoga that showed me I was not in my authentic self. That's what I mean when I say an alignment, I think, is, is actually um, Edward Bach, who did the Bach flower essences, you know, mm -hmm. those the rescue remedy and all that. Uh, he had this great model for health. He said um, something like there's, there's like the ego self and the true self, something like that, he would say. And health is when the two are in alignment, you know, when, when you're living in the way that your spirit dictates, that's health. And any, according to him, any kind of disease, and therefore his Bach flower essences try to salt, try to remedy this really, but any kind of disease is a misalignment between the true self and the way we're living in the world. That's the ego self. And so I, I believe that actually. Hmm. Hmm. So this, I, I think this is interesting because so yoga keeps growing and growing, right? There's so many more people who practice yoga now, like millions and millions of people practice. So are we collectively becoming more comfortable sort and more aligned, um, you know, psychically and, and in our bodies and in our minds. And if so, how does that explain, you know, how does that, how does that jive with the state of our world in the United States today? Oh, God. <laughs> God. Go there. Sorry. Oh. oh, no. All right. All right. I can take it. It's been a month and a half. I'm ready. I can get there. Um, but I mean, I, cause that's something I see. Like I was really very much in a place of like, like, I feel like I see, I mean, it's hard to say because like I live in my own little bubble, right? Where I talk to people who are interested in yoga and mindfulness and all these things, but it seems to be like growing hugely and exponentially. And lots of people are interested, you know, all these people are meditating, like, and all these people are practicing yoga and everybody is trying it or practicing it. So, so, so is there like a collective growth happening or you know, the opposite. I don't know. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you two theories on that. Okay. Um, one theory I've always had is that 
this place we are, it's a little bit touchy feely. I have to warn you. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, I'm prepared. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, maybe move your earbud just a little further from the ear. I don't know. But, but I, I, I believe that this place that we are is like a, uh, actually, I didn't make this up, come to think of it. I got this from Joseph Goldstein. I went to a talk by Joseph Goldstein, the great meditation teacher who's got a prompt in the book, mind you. And uh, he said that this plane of existence, I think he was quoting some Buddhist scripture, actually. It might not even be his, but he said this plane of existence has the perfect amount of pleasure and pain for it to be a place of growth. So mm-hmm. souls come here to grow. I like to think of this plane of existence, this place we are that we incarnate into as almost like, you know, the gold's gym. It's like a, it's like a, <laughs> it's a gymnasium. It's a, it's a large yoga studio and we come here to do spiritual pushups. And so there's the perfect amount of pain and pleasure for those pushups to happen. So that's one possible theory. So, you know, why? So yeah, I think that we use yoga to um, do those spiritual pushups, to grow, to remember the oneness, to, to do all kinds of, of spiritual growth, emotional growth. Um, that's one possibility. One other theory, and this came from a spiritual teacher. I went to a talk uh, recently, great uh, spiritual teacher. Um, can't remember her name, but she's great. Uh, and, <laughs> and she said that uh, the recent events are like, she was saying more that the consciousness as a whole, you know, humanity is evolving and is becoming more conscious. And, you know, like you said, how many people doing yoga is a testament to that. Um, and so she was saying that the current, uh, you know, the recent events are kind of like a last dying sort of backlash of an energy trying to stay the way it was rather than evolve. And, you know, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, it was definitely an interesting, an interesting point. Oh, well, I think I'm going to hold on to that because that's that's my hope, right? Is that is that there it is a, a last dying backlash? That's 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 a really lovely thought that I think will sustain me. <laughs> Good, yeah, yeah, very nice, yeah, That'll sustain me. Well, awesome. So, um, before we go and and let you go, Brian, um, is there anything you'd like to um, share with the listener as far as someone who's in the middle? of their practice and, and may want to deepen it um, a little bit more. Of course, they should buy the teacher peers and use these prompts and have a lot of fun with it and make their yoga really fun with this book because it will. Um, but any, any other advice for someone who wants to deepen their practice? Yeah, I would just want to tell that person that they probably won't be able to deepen their practice unless they buy the book. <laughs> uh, oh, I might have just lied to <laughs> I I if only I had sound effects, I'd like to. <laughs> oh, darn. That, that was a lie. Was a lie. Uh, no, let's see. If somebody wanted to deepen their practice, um, I think, um, you know, I, I think I'm a, I'm a fan of just saying, go to the mat, you know, go to the cushion. You know, we don't need to understand it all. I, sometimes it's good to just get the head out of the way and just go back to the mat, go back to the cushion day after day. It's, it's really in the practice. It's really. Did you hear that? Click? Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That was great. I think I got it right. Was that the sound effect where I got it right? Oh yeah, yes. Like there, uh, it's like God is saying, "Ding!" That's yeah, the right answer. That literally was. That was the sound effect on a game show when you've answered yes, it correctly. It totally was. So I guess that's a good. That's it right there. We got it. We did. We nailed it, Hunter. We We're done. It. I'm done with the podcast. No more questions. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, but you're you're pointing to daily daily practice, like come back, have have a practice, have a have something that you come back to on a regular basis. Absolutely. Exactly, exactly. You know, we don't have to figure it all out. We don't have to understand it all. Just go to the cushion, go to the mat again and again and again. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brian. How can people um, find more about you and more about your book? Uh, yep. So the book is The Teacher Appears, 108 Prompts to Power Your Yoga Practice. A lot of P's in there. And uh, that book should be available anywhere books are sold. They can either get it or request it. Um, obviously, it's on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and hopefully your local bookstore or yoga studio. If they don't have it, you could ask them to. My website is uh, teacherappears.net. And I'd love to hear from anybody. It's great to, uh, to, to hear from readers. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brian. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. 
Thank you so very much for listening to the Mindful Mama podcast. If you like this, please tell a friend about it. Go over to iTunes and leave us a review. Just search for Mindful Mama podcast in the search bar and you'll find the other 49 or so reviews. I read every single one. So if you want to reach me, that's a great way to do that. And it helps other people find the podcast. So it's a great way to support. Um, I hope you enjoyed this interview with Brian. Go get his book. He's so cool and funny and um, there's a lot of wonderful insight and humor in this book and and what better way to have your insight to have it all wrapped up in humor right I love that so if you have any questions you can email me at hunter at hunteryoga.com and remember at the end of March 2017 the 31st through April 2nd uh, Carla Nomberg and I will be leading a retreat at the Copper Beach Weekend. And you can find that at hunteryoga.com slash events. A whole weekend long retreat. It's really lovely. You'll feel totally renewed. And then also on, in May, we have limited spots available for the Mindful Mother's Day day long retreat at the Winter Term Museum in Delaware. And that is at hunteryoga.com slash Mother's Day. So I hope you can join us. I figure come out and completely renewed, relaxed, gain insight, and be with a sisterhood of other amazing mindful mamas. And then the next day, spend the day with your kids, right? I don't know. I'm pretty psyched. So I hope I can see you there, dear listener. That would be really lovely. I'm looking forward to connecting in person. And then finally, I just want to thank William Fields for the music. Thank you, Bill. And thank you again, dear listener. Without you, none of this would be possible. So I really appreciate your support. I love the emails I get. I keep them coming. And um, I'm wishing you a really, really beautiful week. Namaste.